The Old Testament seems to be so much about Israel, but the blessings and the curses involve an even older plot with older promises. On The Bible Brief. Don't forget to listen with a friend beginning on Monday. Invite them to join the journey with us as we begin the New Testament. In his final speech, Moses had put before the nation the blessing and the curse. Blessing if they were to follow the law given by God at Mount Sinai, and cursing if they were to disobey and go their own way. Since that great speech of Moses, the nation had spiraled until the curse set before the people was realized after so many generations. In the Babylonian exile, the culmination of the disobedience of the nation found its time. They were cursed and cast out of the land of Canaan. Now we could simply see this as the story of a people that God chose to use. Or we can look a little bit closer and see that it's a picture of the story of all humanity. A story of blessing and cursing that started way before the call of Abraham to Adam. A story starting with the very blessing of God after he created all things. Three times in the creation account in Genesis 1, we see the bountiful blessing of God pronounced upon creation. He blesses the sea creatures and the birds. He blesses mankind. And he blesses the seventh day of Sabbath rest. The creation emanated with God's blessing and approval, with him finally saying that everything that he had made was very good. God's character is oriented toward blessing and his intent for everything is complete and total blessing. But things went wrong in the garden that God had made. Those humans he made in his image and likeness, with freedom to obey and stay in the blessing, and freedom to disobey and experience cursing, all those humans chose the latter, just like Israel would in generations to come. They chose to eat from the forbidden tree, and for this they were cast out of the garden to experience life in a cursed land to the east. Even worse, however, was the death sentence for their sin against God. While life was abundant in the blessing of the garden, they would experience the curse of death because of their sin. They would experience spiritual death in being separated from God, and physical death having their bodies and their spirits separated. A death penalty of separation as they were barred access from the tree of life and cast away from the garden in permanent exile. In many ways, the history of Israel is an echo and an expansion of an even more fundamental history. A history where not just a nation, but all humanity is subjected to the curse of sin and death. A history where the problem isn't being cast out of the land of Canaan, but being cast out of the Garden of Eden. A history where the curse isn't upon a people, but upon all people. The Bible doesn't merely give us an interesting story of a people group called Israel from Genesis 11 through the end of the Hebrew Bible. No, what it gives us is a microcosm of humanity itself. A picture of what God can do for humanity, but showing what He has done for this national subset. The history of Israel is in a sense a narrative of a foreign people with special promises. But in another sense is the spiritual story of all of us. Just as Israel wants blessing in Canaan, we want blessing in Eden. Just as Israel needs to follow the law of Moses, we need to follow the more fundamental moral law of God. Just as Israel needs circumcised hearts of faith, we need new hearts of faith. And this is where the story finds its unity. The solution for Israel isn't any different from the solution for all of us. It's the oldest promise in the book that's been building ever since the beginning. The promise that the seed of that first woman would finally defeat the evil serpent and by virtue of that become the vehicle of blessing for all of mankind. Since that very first promise, the identification of this seed the Savior, has been narrowing. In Genesis 12 and through the life of Abraham, we learned that this Savior would be a seed of Abraham, 
who would bless the whole world and defeat his enemies. In Genesis 49, as Jacob blessed his twelve sons, we learned that this Savior would be king from the tribe of Judah to rule over Israel and all nations. Generations later, we learned that this Savior would be a seed of David who would finally rule on David's throne over an everlasting kingdom. And by the end of the Hebrew Bible, we can see that this Savior will come from the remnant of David's dynasty that returned to the land of Canaan. The directionality of the Old Testament is a narrowing, a narrowing toward this ultimate Savior, the original seed of the woman, Eve. Yet this genealogical narrowing is matched by a functional expansion. While we learn more about the specifics of the family line from which the Savior will come, we learn much, much more about what this Savior, the Messiah, will accomplish when He finally does come. We learn much of this through the many prophets who express the future hope to be found in the Messiah, the Anointed One. And as the timeline of the Hebrew Bible ends, this message of hope gets louder and louder. David the king and the prophet spoke of an eternal priest king who wouldn't be a priest from the tribe of Levi, but a priest from an even older order of priests. He would be a priest after the order of Melchizedek, that righteous king of Salem whom Abraham had met back in Genesis 14. Later, Isaiah spoke of this high and lifted up eternal priest king, who would also be the servant of God who would die on the people's behalf, taking their sin so that they could be counted righteous. He also spoke of the branch coming from David's family who would have the Spirit of the Lord on him, who would judge with righteousness, a theme which is picked up by many other prophets including Jeremiah, Ezekiel, and Zechariah. Jeremiah in particular identifies this branch as the key to the fulfillment of both the Abrahamic and Davidic covenants, the seed who will rule on David's throne over all Israel and the land promised to Abraham. And these are only tastes of the many, many prophecies concerning the functions of the Messiah throughout the Old Testament. But there's one more prophet we should discuss. And while he does describe more functions of this Messiah, he discusses more about the timing of this Messiah than perhaps any other prophet. Notably, Daniel interprets the Babylonian king's dream about the future as an indication of when the kingdom of God will initiate. The king has a dream about a great statue of many materials, and God allows Daniel to see that this dream is about great empires that will come upon the earth before God's kingdom is set up. First, the Babylonian empire then the Medo-Persian Empire, followed by the Greek Empire, and finally the Roman Empire. It would be after the destruction of these that the kingdom of God would be born to encompass the whole earth. So based on this, we have a loose timeline of when the Messiah will come. And yet Daniel doesn't stop there. In Daniel chapter 9, it's revealed to the prophet that starting at a certain date, there would be a period of 69 times 7 years, 483 years before an anointed one, the Messiah, would be cut off or killed. This is a remarkable prophecy, and the starting point for this 483-year period would be from the going out of the word to restore and rebuild Jerusalem. 483 years from then, the Messiah would be killed. Now, the starting point for this is debated, but it was most likely in about 444 BC with the call for Nehemiah to rebuild the walls of Jerusalem. Based on counting essentially lunar years, this would put the time frame for the Messiah being killed at about 32 or 33 AD. An amazing prophecy revealed by God to this prophet in exile. But the timing isn't all that Daniel saw. He saw a vision that God gave him of something amazing, something in the future, something to look forward to. He said this, Behold, with the clouds of heaven, there came one like the Son of Man. And to him was given dominion and glory and a kingdom, that all peoples, nations, and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away, and his kingdom one that shall not be destroyed. Daniel didn't just see the specificities. He saw the glorious end of the story. One like the Son of Man, seated on his throne. 
But where does all this about the Messiah leave us as the Old Testament closes? Well, the answer is simple. It leaves us with hope. Hope that this story that has been so much about Israel is going to expand once again to encompass all nations. Hope that the Messiah will come to establish his righteous rule on earth. Hope that in just a few centuries, the one we've been waiting for will finally come. What we don't know is exactly how it will all work out. How will the kingdom of God begin? How will this new covenant be established? How can the Messiah be both killed and be king? In what order will this all take place? And perhaps most critically, if Israel has largely rejected all God's prophets that he's sent in the past, will they also reject this prophet like Moses who's coming? The Hebrew Bible closes just buzzing with hope and shouting with praise at what's coming. And if we miss the hope, then we've missed the message. Sin will be dealt with. The enemy will be defeated. Israel will dwell in the land of Canaan. New hearts will be made. Death will be no more. And all those with faith in Messiah will find themselves in the best place possible. The place that God intended. Blessed, holy, and in God's garden city with the Messiah King ruling from his forever throne. Are you ready? Join us next time as we enter the new era of the Bible story, the era of the Messiah. The Bible Brief is brought to you by the Bible Literacy Foundation, dedicated to helping people like you learn the Bible. Copyright Bible Literacy Foundation 2023